hours of Neuro Takeaway. Today, we have the pleasure to receive a brilliant young neuroradiologist. I'd say a futuristic neuroradiologist, Professor Mei Lan Ho. Mei Lan is a director of radiology research, director of the Advanced Neuroimaging Core, chair of the Asian Pacific American Network, and clinical associate professor of radiology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. She focuses in interdisciplinary team science in neurogenomics, neurocomputation, and neurocognition. Um, in her background, uh, she has been in some of the best institutions in the world, as Stanford University, MIT, Harvard Medical School, um, UCSF, Washington, etc. So, without more delays, I would like to go directly to the interview. Thank you much, uh, very much, Dr. Rugilo. It's a great pleasure to be here. Hi, how are you doing, Mainland? <laughs> very well, how are you? Very well. Welcome to Neuro Takeaway. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, um, I want to know because after such an impressive academic education that you received, uh, how come you decided to become a pediatric neuroradiologist? That's an interesting question. Um, I think I'm just excited by things I don't fully understand. So initially started out in chemical engineering because I had an interest in math and science, but then I wanted to really challenge myself and be more practical. So that's how I ended up in chemical engineering. It was supposed to be the hardest major at Stanford. And um, I thought at the time, being somewhat interested in medical school, that there was some curriculum overlap between the two, but it turned out to be very little. <laughs> so um, all of the coursework was really, you'd have, you get three units of credit, but you were working maybe 10, 15 hours a week for that three units. So it was, it was the reverse of some of the other majors where they were uh, meeting several times a week, but not doing a lot of work outside of the classroom. At any rate, uh, chemical engineering was really interesting because it taught me how to think. So the tests were very much open book courses. They, they said, we want you to solve the problem, but we want, don't want you to memorize. We want you to actually figure out what's going on. We want you to understand the fundamentals. And that was a really new experience for me. It was very helpful, I think, long term, but also a little bit challenging when I started medical school because medical school is a lot of memorization and I had lost, that muscle had atrophied for me. <laughs> so, so I think bringing together the engineering perspective with the medical training was really a unique experience and I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but certainly it's not for everyone, but it really gives you a different take on, um, on medicine. And so because I came in with that experience, I had a real focus on engineering and technology. And so radiology was a natural fit for me because of all of the MRI technology and everything is always advancing. And I also felt as an engineer that a lot of this data is captured. Sometimes we say hindsight is 2020. So um, the data is really there and you can analyze it in whatever way you want afterwards. It's not like the pulmonologist who says, well, the lung sounds are like this because I said so and oh, they're not like that anymore, right? So there's, there's less subjectivity to it, I think, to some level. And then in terms of why I decided to do neuro and peds neuro, um, I just think that the, the concept of the brain versus the mind is really fascinating, right? Because you have very complex neuroanatomical structure but that's just really all of our you know, basic motor functions. But what about cognition? What about these higher order things like the personality and the soul? You know, there's a lot of really interesting ideas here that there's this really interface between, I think, the classical sciences and potentially the social sciences. Um, and I do play, I do a lot of, you know, more technical type things, but I also am a violinist, a classical violinist. So I am interested in that interplay between art and science. And pediatric neuroradiology, I think, just brings that extra level of genetics and embryology. So again, things we don't fully understand. So it brings a lot of different disciplines in terms of creating greater understanding of how do we develop, how does the mind develop, and what, you know, what defines us as humans and our existence in general. So I think it's a, it's a larger concept that I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. And as chair of the Asian Pacific American Network, 
how do you compare the neurodiological performance between Asia and the US? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting you would bring that up. I think uh, from my travels, both um, you know, going in person to see uh, different practices and also just helping with electronic, with teleradiology in different countries. I think I've worked with people in every continent except, of course, Australia and Antarctica. Uh, but I've seen radiology practice in the other continents. And I'm, I'm sure you would agree, uh, the same way in South America, there's a level of heterogeneity. It's driven by technology and also resources, right? So in the big cities, like for Garahan Hospital, that's a leading hospital, um, in the big cities in the U.S., you have a lot of people, resources and technology. And so um, you can really push the knowledge and push the uh, radiology acquisition and all of this and, and share cases and so forth. So it's a lot easier to figure things out. But I have even seen in the underserved areas, because nowadays the one generation ago, MR or CT technology is not that expensive, right? There are actually companies that will pay people to get rid of them and they put them, it's, it's kind of sad in the third world countries, but as long as you have an electric plug, it actually will work, right? So you can actually get very good imaging, um, even with the just one generation ago scanners. And so I see some really beautiful images coming out of hospitals that are uh, more underserved, but also they're Ironically, their cases could be more complex because they don't have as much attention to medical care. They may not come to the hospital for most of their lifetimes, or they may have, for instance, let's say a consanguineous genetic disorder. So there are certain communities where they're very familiar with um, being able to make these diagnoses with limited access to technology, but with a lot of experience with that particular disease process. And that also includes things like tropical infections and so forth, which we don't see as much in uh, first world countries. So I think the my idea here is that radiology, more than a lot of different specialties, has the ability to globalize much more readily uh, than than traditional medicine because you don't necessarily have to be there in person. There is this capacity to do teleradiology. The technology access is not that expensive, particularly just slightly older equipment. So um, by really grouping together expertise, by having exciting cross-country collaborations like this, like the visiting professorships, like different pro bono teleradiology, we can really pool expertise and we can bring people who know about, let's say, genetics and embryology and MRI physics together with people who have these very difficult diseases and need uh, time-sensitive help in terms of what to do next. And so I find that a very interesting intersection of knowledge that I wouldn't say that it's really performance is relative in the sense that you can only do the best with what you have. So you could have the best technology and all of this in the world, but if you can't take it to the center of Africa and use it, where let's say someone's dying of hemorrhagic Ebola virus, then it doesn't really matter, right? So this is a challenge in terms of balancing access and expertise. So I think it's a really important topic. And I think that we as radiologists can lead uh, at the front lines of this kind of globalization of healthcare. Right. You know, I have kind of confusion with some terms uh, nowadays. Um, can you explain, explain to us the differences between uh, radiomics, radiogenomics, and multiomics? Because you are an expert on, on, <laughs> on all of them. That's very kind. Uh, I don't think I'm, no one's an expert in these areas because it involves so many different groups, but I can certainly explain the big picture. So omics is this concept of big data, quantitative big data, that we're using to apply to systems biology and systems neuroscience these days. Uh, and in each field, it means something different with respect to the field. So for instance, uh, genomics is the essentially study of large scale genomic data and how do you identify variants of significance that might explain a patient's phenotype. Radiomics is an analogous term used in radiology, where rather than just looking at semantic features that we might describe as radiologists, this is enhancing, this is very enhancing, this is faintly enhancing, this is cystic, this is hemorrhagic, right? So we're imputing from our human experience, having read many cases to do that. But radiomics features would be, you could use semantic features, but you could also do um, quantitative features, so textural analyses. What is, is this a heterogeneous tumor? Can we put numbers on this level of heterogeneity? So there are higher level intensity features like grayscale co-occurrence matrices and hundreds of 
different potential um, textural features. You could describe shape features, size features. So it's basically putting numbers on big data that you can use to better standardize your evaluation of a particular data set. And so radiogenomics, for instance, actually historically radiogenomics was used to refer to tumors, in particular tumor radiation sensitivity, and what genes uh, would predispose a tumor to be more responsive or less to radiation. Uh, in the new interpretation, the imaging genomics or the new version of radiogenomics, now that we have much better understanding of um, how genomics works, is it's still largely within the tumor space, but we talk about different molecular signatures of tumors, such as medulloblastoma, and how that affects prognosis, different types of directed therapy, and life expectancy. But certainly you can apply to other fields as well. Um, other therapies like gene therapy for rare disorders can also be used. And so that's the idea of bringing together genomic data and radiomic data. And so multi-omics is really, go ahead. No, uh, uh, so multi-omics data is really the um, looking at the whole scale, right? So you have not just genomics, but there's epigenomics, right? Which is the control of gene expression. So that's methylation, histones, and so forth. Uh, you have environmental and population genomics. Um, you have the phenomics or clinomics, which is lab values and uh, quantifying, for instance, facial features. So you can look at the dysmorphisms and genetic uh, malformations. And uh, just putting together all of those different data, metabolomics, you can go on and on. But essentially integrating all of these large data sets in a way that enables you to move toward precision medicine, which is essentially saying, all right, I have this cross-section of data from any given individual. How does that predict their disease risk? How would I treat them? How can I predict and counsel them in terms of their life expectancy? And how can I best uh, provide them with care? Okay, interesting. I am um, <clears throat> from, from imaging, uh, on, on imaging, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate a normal variant from a, a congenital uh, abnormality. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Because, for example, for the, with the corpus callosum, uh, it's, for me, sometimes I have difficult to, to say this is abnormal, this is a variant. What's your opinion? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you don't have as much difficulty as you, you say you do, Carlos, because you're extremely talented. Uh, but I can definitely provide my, uh, my humble insights here. So there is a saying in radiology that normal is the hardest thing to call. And I think that's even more true in pediatrics because with age, with development, you have different appearances. You have sulcation, myelination through fetal and uh, young adult life. You have a variety of different variants that can potentially, so for instance, the cavum septum callustum, right? In adult neuroradiology, people say, oh, who cares? It doesn't mean anything. But in children, sometimes if it fails to, it is a normal variant, but then the septal leaves should normally co-apt in that potential space. And if you actually see that, particularly if it's large and cystic dilated, then there is an increased risk of midline malformations, and people have shown that. So it's kind of one of these things where you're talking about the bell curve, right? So there's a normal bell curve, but then it shifts, right? And so there's a certain level of overlap between normal variants and potential abnormalities. So I think um, part of it is gonna depend just on knowledge of the normal variation with experience on the age and the stage of development and just knowing what their range of potential looks like for that particular patient. But another very important part I think is the clinical picture. Right, so one thing we struggle with a lot as pediatric neuroradiologists is these focal cortical dysplasias. They can be very, very subtle. Some of them are considered imaging negative, or there's just a just a little, you know, touch of blurring or something. And you'll you'll see that, or sometimes you'll see something a little bit more obvious, like you know, a little bit of a deep sulcus or something. But on the other hand, it's a complex folded area. So it's one thing to have a completely developmentally normal, let's say, 13 year old has never had any issues, right? It's another thing to have a developmentally delayed three-year-old has had repeated seizures even after a non -fibrous. It's a very different clinic. I think that with our current imaging techniques, particularly when we're just looking at mostly anatomy, there's certainly things we could be missing, both false positives and negatives, but it's really important to put it with a clinical picture because it's really a Bayesian analysis, right? It's looking at a pretest probability and saying, what is the harm 
you know, what is the added benefit versus risk of reporting something a certain way, right? So if they're really looking for a focus and you find something that's suspicious, that could be really meaningful because you can resect it and they can be seizure free. If they're really just doing a rule out and they have a headache and otherwise they're normal, no one's concerned, maybe they, they were in a minor car accident, then yes, okay, maybe we are missing a dysplasia, but on the other hand, maybe they'll be healthy for most of their life or all of their life and not have this morbidity from an unnecessary surgery. So I think a lot of times it's also just putting it into clinical context and really appreciating as much as you can Having a good knowledge of the normal development, but then also accounting for the clinical history, I think is really important. That's very important. I agree, completely agree. And the problem is that sometimes we don't have the, that information, at least in- That's true too. <laughs> that is a common issue and either lacking or incorrect, frankly, incorrect, misleading clinical information. And, and these are always problems. And so again, it, it comes down to Bayesian analysis. So I, I don't mind doing addendums on reports if something becomes highly suspicious, but I also don't like to put um, disproportionate weight on the clinical. So there are people who will kind of look at the history and then go looking for that one thing that is suggested. And I find that to be a very misleading way because a lot of times the clinician wasn't the MD may not have even been the one who put the order in, right? It was just someone passed it on to someone. And so you get kind of tunnel vision that way, and you need to keep your differential broad to start. So certainly there is like an informed, careful satisfaction of search, and then you should put some weight on the clinical diagnosis, but it should not be 100% for sure. I totally agree. What's your reaction when you receive a, a genetic test that says, a likely pathogenic mutation? Um, I, I have to admit that on uh, most of the time, I don't have that experience. Most of the time, the genetic testing occurs long after the radiology has been reported. Um, we have certainly in our, in our U.S. healthcare system a number of delays with insurance uh, reimbursements and so forth. So most of the time, if genetic testing is recommended, it happens after the MRI based on the results of the MRI. And then usually what we see, and there's a rare minority of cases where the suspected diagnosis is confirmed. So we do a single gene or more often a gene panel, and one of those is positive, likely pathogenic or definitely pathogenic. The large majority of the time, it's variant of unknown significance. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem, right, that the VUS can be anything. It could be no significance or it could be we just don't know yet. And for these cases, what we usually do, the practice we have here at our Genomic Institute, is they'll have someone like me, someone who's specifically interested in neurogenetics, review the case for any subtle imaging features that may have been not mentioned the first go around. And then in about six months to a year, they actually do a reanalysis. So they'll go back and deep sequence based on the additional imaging phenotype that was found they'll actually pay more attention to those genes. And then they will also do a literature search to see if any new variants have been reported in the interim in uh, major medical journals. So I think that, um, unfortunately, the, the slam dunk approach usually doesn't happen right away. It's a bit of a delayed gratification. But I think our role as radiologists is really important. Um, a well-trained pediatric neuroradiologist can find fairly subtle features on the MRI, and that can completely change the course of the genetic testing. Genetic testing is not a gold standard per se. Um, if they don't do deep sequencing, if they're just looking at the whole genome or the whole exome, it's very different from targeting certain genes and saying, I'm gonna sequence this particular set of genes related to those particular malformations on MRI 100 or 1,000 times, and that's much more likely to succeed, particularly if you have these rare somatic variants. So. Um, there are cases that are slam dunks, but most of the time it's the unknown significance where we have to keep following up. And then the MRI input does really play a big role, as does the other case, but it's much more rare. Mm. You, you wrote a, a successful book, a textbook, about a neuroradiology science. Um, I, I wonder, is it possible to define a clinical entity, uh, a congenital entity, from an imaging pattern? Can we? Assure that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the longer I go on in my career, the less I like the word pathognomonic. <laughs> everything, everything that I was taught in med school or, or radiology training about pathognomonic was not true. 
So in life, it just makes sense that nothing would be 100% ever, right? Even things that you swear, like, oh, this is a classic meningioma, right? And then it turns out to be something else on biopsy. So I think that signs are helpful, particularly when you're in training. Uh, there are certain features on imaging that help us to kind of understand the growth pattern or the origin of a lesion, or for instance, a metabolic disorder, like the tigroid pattern of MLD. But these are fairly few and far between. And then as we understand more and more about genetics, I think that that golden age of saying, okay, uh, this, dis this metabolic disorder and this MRI phenotype are one-to-one -one linked, right? Because it depends on the mutations, even for any, just a single gene disorder, right? It depends on the severity of the mutation. So do you have complete loss of the protein product or is it just partially, uh, partially dystrophic? And then you have the epigenetics, and then you have multiple genes in the same pathway that can create phenocopies. You have environmental um, effects that can create phenocopies. So it gets more and more complex. So I would say in, in practice that, you know, I don't believe in pathognomonic science, but there are certainly some features, particularly if you put it together with, if you put together a constellation of imaging features and, you know, potentially a certain kind of clinical presentation, it can be very highly suggestive. So I don't want to discourage young people from learning these signs, but I just want them to take it with a grain of salt because everything in medicine should be. They, they help a lot. Um, in cases of mosaicism, where the, the brain is probably the only tissue that harbors a certain mutation, what can we do to confirm the diagnosis of a genetic alteration? That's a really insightful question, um, and it's ahead of its time, in fact. Um, so you are correct that when you have a somatic mutation, by definition, it only involves part of the body. It's a post-zygotic mutation, and so only that segment of the brain in or face may be involved. So really the only way, if you're, if you're getting an MRI and you suspect, let's say, an overgrowth syndrome yeah. of the brain, the only way is to get tissue from the affected area at the moment. So um, some people, so let's say if it's a tumor or an epilepsy case, potentially it may be possible to go in and get brain tissue, but that is of course very invasive. Um, if you are looking to be less invasive, sometimes the skin of the face. We actually have um, a lab here, for example, that uh, does what's called organoid development. So you can actually take fibroblasts from the skin or the cheek um, and you can deprogram them into stem cells and then you can reprogram them into brain cells, brain organoids. So you can actually model early development of these mutant cells. So you could recapitulate in an in vitro model um, these same overgrowth features. So it's kind of cool. So we've done that for tuberous sclerosis and some of the cortical, uh, focal cortical dysplasias. So that's kind of the answer for today, right? There is something called liquid biopsy. So um, this is the concept that they're using now with the cell-free DNA or the circulating DNA for the fetus because the placenta the blood brain, the placental uh, blood bear is not complete. So there's maybe a hundredth or a thousandth or some very minute percentage of DNA that will float into the mother's blood. So that's how you can gender and test for trisomies and so forth in the fetus. And so you can actually do something similar. They have done this with uh, CNS tumors. So you can uh, look at blood or you can look at CSF and potentially detect molecular markers of the tumor. But again, you have to be at a really high-end genomics place where they're doing very, very deep sequencing because you have to do thousands or you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of runs to maybe detect this 0.001% of DNA that's floating around, right? So that is possible, though. That is probably the future of non-invasive or liquid biopsy. Have you recently changed uh, your approach to cortical malformations in terms of your report? Uh, taking into account the new concepts of polymicrogyria like uh, cobblestone cortex and so on? Yeah, that's a really good point. So polymicrogyria is a very um, imaging and etiologically heterogeneous term. So you can have genetic polymicrogyria, you can have um, acquired insults, you know, uh, early ischemia or infection leading to polymicrogyria like in CMV or fetal infarcts. Um, so it can be very, uh, many different causes. And then in terms of the imaging appearance, that's also heterogeneous, right? So at conventional three Tesla, they talk about the fine irregular, and then you have the coarse palisaded and the sawtooth forms of PMG. But I've done some work with the ultra high field or seven Tesla MR, and actually all of those forms look 
very similar at 70. So they all have these very tiny sulcine gyri, but it's just a question of volume averaging, right? So at 3T, we're getting all of the tiny ones that are collapsed into one voxel, and so it looks thicker and more palisaded, but it's really just a bunch of tiny irregular ones. So they do look fairly similar on very high field imaging. Um, and certainly on pathology as well, there's certain common features in terms of the irregularity at the gray-white junction, uh, the cortical organization. So that's why the diagnosis is logic, but we're moving towards that level of microscopic MR with the ultra-high field techniques. The cobblestone cortex is an interesting one. So with earlier imaging uh, technologies, they used to confuse, the, they used to call it polymicrogyria, but certainly you have other features as well. You have the cerebellar cysts, you have the uh, abnormal white matter. And so the molecular mechanism is completely different, right? Because as you know, we have the glia limitons. And so the defects in the dystroglycan or the laminin uh, cause the abnormalities of binding in the muscle, eye, and brain. Basically, the um, the cells cannot bind to the uh, extracellular basement membrane. So what happens is you get these little gaps in the glial limitons, and in the cortex, you have over-migration. There's defects in the molecular layer, so the cortex uh, does not know when to stop, so it keeps migrating through, and so you get this little cobblestoning through. Um, and then the situation in the posterior fossa is a little bit different. So in the posterior fossa, the external granule cells migrate. Uh, they're guided by adhesions, to the glial limiton. So when there are fairs of adhesion, you actually get these little cystic inclusions, these little leptomeningeal cysts. They're just CSF-lined peripheral cysts. So they, they used to call them peripheral cerebellar cysts, but in fact, they're little CSF inclusions. So it's all molecules in embryology. Um, the other piece is the white matter, right? So the, it's thought that the water homeostasis in the myelin, that this process uh, impairs that. So then you get free water exuding into the, into the white matter. So it all comes down to molecular mechanisms and to pathologic findings. And that was how they actually first discovered cobblestone cortex, that they looked at the pathology and was totally different, that the cortical cells were normal, but then they were just piled up through the basement membrane. And they looked at the cerebellum and it was the same thing with the adhesions. And so the only way we're gonna be able to tell is number one, by radiologic pathologic correlation with molecular models like the organoids, and number two, by improving our imaging so that we have better resolution that mirrors microscopic. So yes, I do report these differently when I see the spectrum of abnormalities uh, with the cerebellum and the white matter. Um, if I, I see that spectrum, I'm very suspicious for cobblestone or muscle eye brain spectrum. Of course, if you have the eye, then it's Walker Warburg and the uh, kinked brainstem. Um, if I just see isolated irregularity in regional areas, um, I tend to call it polymicrogyria. We could potentially refine these even more in future because it's just semantic. But again, I just think it comes back to etiology and context. So are there other imaging findings? Do you have genetic testing or clinical features that make you suspicious for one versus the other? But I think it's a great question. Okay. Um, I, I know that you are an expert on translational medicine. What's translational medicine? And what does it have to do with uh, neuroradiology? That's a great question. I'm not an expert. I don't think anyone is, but I, I, will, I will speak to it as much as I can do with decency. So the, the idea of translational medicine, uh, the physician scientist, is really from bench to bedside, right? So we have basic scientists uh, who deal with, you know, lab work and, you know, they're, they're locked up in their lab doing experiments that may never see the light of day. So they may make it into science or nature, but then what does, what does the human population get out of it, right? So the idea is to actually translate these meaningful discoveries, right? To innovate by, by taking current knowledge and bringing it into the bedside. So where can these discoveries in science and technology impact patient care? So I think radiology is really well poised to um, honor this translational model of medicine because we deal so much with imaging technology and it's constantly, you know, the different vendors are working on new MRI sequences and better scanners and all of this, and certainly the other modalities as well, but particularly MRI um, and nuclear medicine tracers, for instance. So we have continually new and better ways to image the body, to learn more about tissue biomarkers, tissue properties, both anatomic and functional. And 
the challenge is to be able to take those different metrics and really relate them to precision medicine. So how can we take these biomarkers and validate them for predicting non-invasively different things about a patient? Because that really helps our clinicians. It helps our diagnosticians. So. Okay. Um, when it comes to organize a interdisciplinary team science in, in a hospital, which are the main players? How, wh where do we start? Yeah, that's um, that's a really good question, and it's it, I think it depends a lot on the question you're trying to solve because the idea is to bring the team together around a common problem, but to integrate different perspectives and have each person work on a complementary part of that. I will speak from the perspective of radiology or medical questions in general. I think, like we said, there's bench to bedside. So on the one side, you definitely need someone who's in basic science drive the science of it. So, and to bring up uh, cutting edge technology so that you have whatever the state of the art is to answer your question and then potentially to push it farther. Then you need the practical uh, side, which is the clinicians. So you need a clinician partner because generally radiologists don't own the patients, right? We just, we image whoever comes to us like pathology. So um, you need someone on the clinical side who takes interest in your particular uh, medical question and is willing to refer and enroll and consent the patients for your particular research question. So radiology is really primed to be at the intersection of these two because we already naturally consult across the hospital on the clinical side. We already interface with all these different groups and now we're just doing it in a research capacity. The last piece I would say is the community. So even if we get it into clinical practice, if the public doesn't really know about it and benefit from it, it hasn't really worked. So I think this is where the social and population sciences really come into play. Um, there's certainly a degree of you know, marketing and social media and those kinds of things as well. Uh, but just really getting the word out there, having good community partnerships um, and you know, making sure that you serve the population that you're intending to serve, potentially worldwide, if you can make the technology and the discoveries worldwide. What was the most difficult case that you've ever faced? You know, I've seen some interesting cases. I don't know. It's hard to define difficult. I think it depends on the person because some cases, they don't really look that difficult, but then when they go to biopsy or you get some genetic test back and you're like, what the heck, right? I didn't expect that. So, but then it's not really gettable in the sense that, well, okay, now we're going to learn from this, but there's nothing from imaging that would really tell you. Um, and then there's certainly cases that are very complex. Like I see a lot of very complex genetic ones and sometimes they lead to uh, descriptions of new syndromes and so forth, but then they just take a lot of time and care. Um, and then there's the really ugly ones, which are just, for instance, metastases that are everywhere, or something that's very, you know, you know, challenging to read, but not necessarily a diagnostic challenge, just more of a, a reporting challenge. So I think for me, the the most challenging types of cases as a group are not so much uh, with regard to what the diagnosis is or how I read it, but kind of the response of the clinician. Uh, because in general, I think we've already alluded to this many times in the talk, but radiology really is not black and white, it's shades of gray, right? And there's a very Bayesian principle to it that certain things make it more or less probable, but nothing's ever really an absolute. And I think that most people in practice understand that, but once in a while you'll get uh, certain referring physicians who really want it to be solid yes or no, um, black or white, and they don't really account for these shades of gray. And so I find that a little bit challenging because I don't like to let, I want my report to be objective and not to be affected by certain, you know, personal or outside factors. And so I find that wording a little bit challenging. So I think that everyone has these challenges um, with certain referring in certain groups. And it's, I think it's a matter of trying to make sure you can stay true to yourself and really help the end patient while also respecting some of the intermediary parties, but to try to still remember that your ultimate service is to the patient. I agree. What will neuroradiologists be like in 10 years? How do you that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not sure that I or anyone else knows, but I can give it a guess. Uh, there's certainly a lot of hype uh, right now, potentially overhyped, but uh, about AI and the 
the role it will play in radiology. And I think AI is very hot, as you know, in many areas, self-driving cars and online marketing and all of this. So in, it's having a renaissance first in radiology, really, because we have the digital PAC system. So we have 20, 25 years of retrospective data that um, these deep learning algorithms can operate on that whereas the pulmonologists or the cardiologists, you can't chase them around and force them to record hard sounds with their stethoscope for you to, to collect the big data to analyze. So we, are, we definitely already have AI algorithms that are being used experimentally to optimize workflow, to kind of standardize reports, essentially to serve almost as a trainee or a reading room assistant, right? And I think that you know, you have to look at this as an opportunity rather than a threat because we all deal with lots of, you know, mundane, annoying things. Uh, this is more an adult neurodegenerative thing, but the degenerative disc disease in the spine and the, you know, old brains with atrophy and several multiple sclerosis lesions that you're following up and maybe there's a new one, maybe there's not. So there's a lot of these very mundane tests that don't require an incredible amount of skill once you you've learned how to do them, I think AI can really help with, because certainly there's a lot of volume and there's more volume. The uh, scanners are getting faster all the time. So there's definitely more work than there are radiologists. So I think the, the opportunity for us, number one, is to focus on the really difficult and challenging cases, right? And to spend our time celebrating on these challenging things and how we can reach outside our specialty and learn interesting things like genetics and embryology to better understand these complex malformations like the ones we've described. Another aspect, I think, also is that people overrate deep learning, right? So deep learning is really an artificial neural network, and it learns what you train it. So if you give it a training set and then you ask it to do an identical task, it will do it. But there could be all sorts of things you didn't predict. Maybe it's a different scanner, different institution, different data set. And so the performance can be really terrible sometimes. And so we really have to be the curators of the AI, right? We have to say, is this a reasonable a uh, reasonable result. If not, how can we uh, better train the algorithm? How can we improve? So we're really the human element. We're the input uh, into these into these uh, very powerful computing tools. And so I see our role as being and being able to do more, better, and faster with the aid of computing. Okay. Uh, tell me. In terms of neurocomputation, uh, we have to think that our brain works as a computer does. I mean, we are That's computers <laughs> in the end. <laughs> a very interesting question. So there have, uh, in computer science for many years, they've been trying to develop so-called perceptrons, right? So different forms of machine learning, machine intelligence. And it's only, in the last several years with the GPU computing powers that this concept of deep learning has come into vogue. So deep learning is basically their artificial neural networks and they are just multiple layers of, of computing where you can weight the matrices and you can kind of model in a very primitive way the uh, architecture of the human brain in terms of axons and dendrites. But it's not perfect. They, they're developing different architectures all the time, but it's really one layer communicates with another, communicates with another. And there's just many, many different layers and lots of computing power. So you can use it to classify, particularly for classification tasks. It can be helpful, um, what they call simple AI. And more recently, something that's come into vogue is these uh, GANs, the generative adversarial networks, they create fake data. So there's this web page, uh, this person does not exist online, where the faces look very real and the algorithm is uh, they can create synthetic synthetic images. There are a lot of different research in this area, but they only touch upon the very surface of what we understand, the very simple mathematical models still of uh, human brains. And so I would argue that it's really the inverse, that our computers are trying to work as brains do. And the more we understand about the brain, uh, the better we are getting at it. So it's, it's helpful, but still, even with the current power, there are many less synapses uh, in your A and N than there would be in a human brain. And then you're not accounting for things like um, fault tolerance, like uh, regeneration of the network, or relearning. So it'll learn something, it'll be fixed. So if it's learned incorrectly, it can't relearn. You actually have to retrain and so forth. So I think that us with our human insight and our 
you know, morals and our ethics and our, our just different, uh, our outlook in terms of our philosophical outlook on life, we're really well positioned to guide the, and we have to, we really, in terms of social responsibility, we really need to guide these algorithms in the right direction. But I think there's really great possibility for it as we continue to do it. And we're nowhere near this, what we call complex AI, where it doesn't have to be supervised and it can do any task whatsoever. So we're very far away from that, but we really should get on board and um, help steer the direction of it before we ever get to that point. Well, I don't wanna take up your valuable time any longer. I thank you very much for accepting the invitation, but let me tell you something. I don't know how a neuroradiologist of the future will be like, but I guess it will be very similar to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. I think we're always evolving and always growing, so thank you it's very great much. to hear. I hope thank you our, so much. Our upcoming book have a lot of, uh, of success. Sounds great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I'm very honored to be part of it. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.